Hi everyone and welcome to today's meeting of Oxford University's Southernising Criminology Discussion Group. Um, we're really sad to not have you all here in Oxford um, on what is an unusually sunny day, um, but we're so thrilled to have so many international participants joining us this afternoon. Um, just, to let, just to give you a very brief introduction to our group, um, my name is Lucy Harry and I'm here with my fellow DPhil student and co-convener Louise Del Santo. Um, we're a student-led initiative who aim to foster discussions about criminology that move beyond the so-called global north. Um, this term, we've been hosting events that focus on criminological contributions from particular geographical regions, um, and today we'll be focusing on Latin America. We are incredibly fortunate as um, today we have two speakers um, who will be presenting on this topic. First, we'll have Professor Manuel Itzoralde, who will be discussing criminology in Spanish speaking Latin America, before moving on to a presentation by Professor Maurizio Dita, who will be discussing criminology in Brazil. And perhaps in the discussion section, um, we can think about the relationship between these two bodies of criminological knowledge. Um, just to give you some information about the format of this event, each speaker will talk for roughly 20 minutes and then afterwards we'll have a discussion section for about 30 minutes. Um, so please note that this event will likely run for about an hour and a half. Um, we are recording the speaker's presentations, um, but we will turn off the recording for the discussion section. Um, and could we kindly ask you all to mute yourselves during the presentations? Um, and then when we move on to the discussion, you can either raise your hand or write your question in the chat function um, and we'll call upon you to ask your questions. Um, I think that's all I have to say in terms of practicalities. So I'll hand over to Louise to introduce today's speakers. Brilliant. Hello, everybody. Um, so today we are delighted to be hosting both Professor Manuel Iturralde and Mauricio Dieter. Um, so I'll introduce each speaker in turn. Uh, Dr. Iturralde holds a Bachelor degree in law from Univers uh, Universidad de los Andes uh, and an LLM and a PhD degree in law from the London School of Economics. He was director of the Public Interest Law Group, which is a legal clinic, between 2010 and 2013. Manuel is currently co-director of the Prisons Group, a legal clinic, and an associate professor of the School of Law at Universidad de los Andes. Manuel's recent research has focused on the political economy of punishment, particularly in Colombia and more broadly Latin America. Our second speaker, Dr. Mauricio Jitter, is a senior reader of criminology and criminal law at the Faculty of Law of the University of Sao Paulo. He received his PhD from the Federal University of Paraná and his postdoc at the State University of Rio de Janeiro. He has held positions at the Max Planck Institute for Foreign and International Criminal Law, the Universidad Autónoma Latinoamericana, Colombia, the Faculty of Social Sciences at the University of Westminster, and as a visiting professor at the Universidad San Carlos de Guatemala. He's also a criminal barrister. So thank you both for so kindly agreeing to speak during such challenging times. I'm thrilled to hand over to you, Manuel, to kick off the session. Over to you. Thank you, Luis, and thank you, Lucy, for your invitation. I'm very glad to be here with you. Uh, before I start my presentation, uh, I don't want to uh, give you any high expectations. I, I think it's really difficult or impossible, or impossible, at least for me, to map uh, Latin American criminology because first, uh, as I will discuss, I'm not sure if we can talk about uh, Latin American criminology like, like uh, as a monolithic discipline or body of work. So uh, maybe I'm not going to be very detailed about specific topics of research that uh, are being developed in the region. Rather, I would like to try to actual map about the history and trajectory of what may be called or may not, uh, we will discuss that, uh, Latin American uh, criminology. Uh, so I will share my presentation with you. Just a second, please. And please let me know if you can see it. Just a sec. Okay, can you see it? 
Yeah. Okay, let's get started. So uh, I will divide my presentation in three basic parts. The first one is a very brief uh, context of uh, Latin America, uh, especially regarding the problem of violence and crime. Uh, secondly, I will talk about, or I'll, I will discuss if we can talk about that Latin American criminology. Uh, I will start uh, with maybe the strongest and more monolithic movement we had in the region in the, from the 70s, which is a Latin American critical criminology. And then I will discuss uh, what I think is a very interesting trend, which is developing right now, which is Southern criminology. So I will speak about that and, and discuss it, whether we can talk about a Southern criminology that uh, includes uh, Latin American studies and research. And finally, uh, I will discuss some possible topics of research, uh, not only that have come to my mind, but that, that I have discussed with other colleagues and that I have found in different and recent articles uh, uh, which discuss uh, the topics or the research agenda of uh, a Southern criminology, also from a Latin American perspective. So first, the Latin American context. Uh, it's not a surprise that uh, crime and social control or the control of crime is a, a very important topic uh, for Latin American social studies. Uh, first of all, because uh, Latin America has some features which make it a very fertile, fertile ground of research. First of all, uh, as you may know, Latin America is the most unequal region in the world. It features the highest levels of violence and criminality worldwide. And, and there's also social perception of insecurity and distrust towards fellow citizens and the state, which are really high. Uh, and this results in states, in Latin American states, uh, with low levels of legitimacy, which react in very punitive ways, which are manifested especially through excessive and lethal use of force by security agencies, especially the police, and also by, by high and increasing imprisonment rates. So to give you some examples, uh, we can say that the average imprisonment uh, rate uh, was 19, 1970 inmates uh, per 100,000 inhabitants in 1990, and in 2020 it reached 272, which is a 180% increase. Also, by 2017, uh, Central and South America were the most uh, violent regions of the world, with the highest rates of uh, intentional homicides, uh, more than 25. Uh, point 0.9 in the case of Central America and 24.2 uh, in the case of South America. Also, South America and Central America have the highest levels of reported physical assaults and violent robberies in the world. Uh, for instance, uh, while in Central America it was around uh, 426.28, in Western Europe, to make a comparison, it, it was 226. And finally, uh, Latin America's population, which is, I think this is all data, is represents 8% of the world's population, yet it's victim of 33% of the world population. So, as I told you, uh, it's not a surprise that uh, crime, uh, violence, and crime control are very, very important topics in Latin American uh, research, especially uh, from a social sciences perspective. Can we talk about the Latin American criminology? Uh, as, a, uh, as you may know, uh, this is a big region with very different countries, cultures, and political economies. But uh, there's been an attempt to talk about a Latin American cri criminology, especially uh, from the 70s, where the, it was a time of critical criminology and uh, Latin America was not an exception. So uh, a, a series of conferences, publications, research, and especially of scholars interested in this topic from a critical perspective, uh, developed about having our own Latin American critical criminology. Especially, the main aim of this movement was to contradict paradigms, paradigms coming from so, as critical criminologists uh, told in the 70s, uh, we needed a criminology for Latin America made by Latin Americans. And the main aim of this kind of research agenda was uh, a critique of practices of social control, uh, which were not, as critical criminology taught us, not, were not uh, aimed at controlling crime, but rather to keep in check the excluded, which in Colombia uh, make a significant part of the population. 
Also, a, a critical criminology in Latin America from the 70s was a reaction against positivist criminology introduced in the 19th century, uh, which legitimized uh, uh, the ruling uh, power of some elites, uh, which claimed to have a racial superiority over most of the population, especially Afro-Americans and indigenous peoples. Uh, critical criminology in Latin America also uh, critiqued imported criminologies as legitimating devices of the elites to control the enrolling population. So, especially in the 70s, uh, we st uh, this school of critical criminology studied especially European criminology, but also uh, North American criminology. But uh, the, cons uh, the consensus uh, from this critical perspective that well, thus importing theories was not useful to explain the Latin American context. Also, one point of critique of Latin American critical criminology was uh, the traditional criminology approach, a uh, modernization or development approach, which very simply, uh, or simplifying it, uh, said that Latin American countries in the 20th century were experiencing uh, the realities of 19th century uh, Europe, especially uh, the process of modernization and industrialization, which uh, meant an upsurge in crime and social disorder. Uh, so uh, this stance of this developmental uh, modernization stance of traditional criminology was also an object of critique by Latin American critical criminologists. And finally, uh, I should say, or I think that one of the main features of Latin American critical criminology of the 70s was uh, the influence of especially critical criminology and critical social theories coming especially from continental Europe, especially the Frankfurt School, the work of Foucault, Melosi and Pavarini, and Barata, which was very influential among uh, Latin American scholars during the 70s and 80s. What happened? Uh, even if uh, Latin American critical criminology was very strong in the 70s and in the 80s, uh, I think that in the 90s it faded. The reasons are varied. Uh, maybe uh, it has to do with uh, the democratization process in Latin America, uh, the uh, opening of Latin American economies to globalization, and the, the uh, uh, rising of neoliberalism as the main dogma or doctrine, not only economic doctrine, but also a, a very, very influential in the social sciences. So uh, this meant like the demise of the more uh, traditional critical uh, stances of criminology in the region. Now, can we talk uh, about the Southern criminology in Latin America? Uh, so we have to map what is going on on the region right now. As I told you at the beginning, uh, I feel uncomfortable, and I have discussed this with my dear friend and colleague, Maximo Soso, which is here, uh, who is here, uh, that it's very difficult to talk about uh, Latin America criminology as a, a monolithic, coherent body of work or under the umbrella of an academic discipline. But nevertheless, w uh, something which is very interesting from the 90s is the salience and the numerous research uh, uh, studies uh, and debates regarding the problem of violence and crime in the region, especially from the 90s. And this is quite paradoxical because the 90s marked the end of authoritarian regimes in most of the region, especially military dictatorships, and a strong process of democratization, but also of, as I told you, within the globalization uh, economic process, uh, the opening up of uh, Latin American economies and strong and very profound economic and structural reforms of a neoliberal uh, leaning. So uh, from the 90s, uh, the problem of violence and crime in the region uh, became a salient topic of uh, discussion, not only among social researchers, but also between politicians and public opinion, which regarded the problem of crime as one of the most salient problems in the region. So I think uh, this particular social, political, and economic context sparked a lively debate on violence and crime in the region and also on uh, crime control. So what, what we can see from the 90s onwards in Latin America is a profuse and expanding literature on violence and crime on the one hand and crime control on the other. Uh, but developed, as I said before, not from the umbrella of a criminological discipline, but from different social sciences perspectives. And not all of them uh, progressive. So uh, I think this is also a very important difference uh, regarding uh, these new types of studies and uh, the previous critical criminology uh, theory, which is that you have different 
political and ideological stances towards the problem of violence and crime. For instance, that's in, this is the case in Colombia. I would say that a critical criminologist uh, were replaced in Colombia in the 90s, especially by economists with a very li liberal or even neoliberal ideology, which regarded, which uh, developed like the traditional economic analysis of crime, which understands crime basically as the outcome of the rational, uh, selfish decisions uh, made by individuals who, if they find uh, greater regrets than punish punishments in committing crimes, they will likely uh, commit crimes. So I think in Colombia, this has been a very influential perspective on the study of violence and crime, drug trafficking and the Colombian armed conflict. So as I told you, unlike other parts of the world, uh, uh, Liter Latin American literature regarding crime and crime control uh, has not grown within a specific academic discipline, such as criminology, but through different lenses, theoretical and methodological lenses, which is very interesting, but makes very difficult to map like a coherent body of work or methodological uh, research regarding these topics. So as I told you, most of the research on crime and crime control has been addressed from different academic disciplines like sociology, anthropology, political science, social communication and cultural studies, and economics, among others. All these disciplines have also been the product of a relatively recent institutionalization process from the second half of the 20th century within Latin American academic fields. So we have developed, I think, and we can discuss that, uh, in universities, research centers, uh, think tanks, a strong body of research uh, on these topics, but from different disciplines that many times do not dialogue uh, between each other. So this is a complex and multidimensional multi multi map, uh, which is really hard uh, to understand or to explain, especially in 20 minutes. Well, so I, I think another topic of discussion could be why there is not a consolidated and institutionalized discipline such as criminology uh, in the Latin American field that systematically discusses these subjects. I think the reasons are varied. Uh, one of them, uh, at least that is really the case in Colombia, is that criminology has not formed as an autonomous discipline. In Colombia, criminology, and I think that's the case in many Latin American countries, is like a an appendix of criminal law. So usually you find that criminology in Colombia, at least, is discussed, if it is discussed at all, in law faculties. And many of those who research or write articles on criminological uh, topics are usually criminal lawyers who, uh, I, say, I, I, I should say jokingly, like as a hobby in their spare time, write some criminal, on some criminological topics. But at least in Colombia, criminology has not developed as an autonomous discipline. And I think that's one of the reasons why we have such a varied uh, uh, and multidimensional field. Also, I think that one problem that we have in Latin America is that we lack associ uh, criminological associations. Of course, there are some criminological associations, but they have not been able to uh, construct a wide network of research and debate among scholars in Latin America. And also, I think we lack uh, enough uh, publication, specialized publication on criminology or the social of, of punishment that may uh, spring some discussions among lat Latin Americans. Of course, there are publications, and very important publications, like the Lituan Sociedad, who publish this kind of research, but uh, it is difficult uh, to have like a common debate or dialogue of points of encounter to discuss articles published uh, in these kind of journals. And I think also one problem is that uh, those who write or research on criminology tend to publish in Global North journals, specialized criminological journals, in order to uh, reach a broader audience, which is counterproductive because we are trying to establish a dialogue with the Global North, but are not very interested or haven't focused on developing a dialogue between Latin Americans. I think that a, a promising aspect is the development of what has been called Southern criminology. 
as developed by authors such as Carrington and Hood, and also Maximus also, who's here. So, recent debates on the decolonization of criminology have prompted the call for a Southern criminology, uh, which, uh, with its own global South research agendas, theories, and scholars, which includes also Latin America. And I would like to discuss this with you, maybe we can discuss it later, it's what's the debate on Southern criminology right now? First, the colonization is viewed primarily as an epistemological problem. So, Southern criminologists tell us uh, we have to transform the systems of knowledge production and power relations that make global South criminology dependent on global North theories and research agendas. So, we have to gain independence, especially epistemological independence, from the global North. Also, there's been a reification of Southern traditional responses to crime, especially indigenous and restorative justice, which are seen like a more positive and alternative forms of dealing with crime, violence, and social disorder. But also, there's another current uh, which discusses, from a critical point of view, uh, this, uh, let's call it, fixation of Southern criminology with the epistemological agenda, and that are pointing out that we should focus rather on the problem of postcoloniality itself, how postcoloniality manifests nowadays in the global south. So, according to this analysis, uh, empire uh, is a living structure, not only a relief from the past, whose uh, we, uh, the effects of which are felt in the present, and being a living structure, we have to study it, assess it, and critique it in order to overcome it. And in this way, uh, authors such as uh, Chokini and Greenen talk about empire as a global system of capitalist accumulation founded on the colonial matrix of inequality, appropriation, dispossession, and exploitation through violent means. So, rather than focusing on the epistemological problem of uh, criminology, Chokini and Greenen claim that we have to focus on the manifestation and the expression of empire in global South countries, which of course include Latin American countries. And just to finish my presentation, I would like to point out some possible topics of research for the criminological analysis of what these authors have called the neocolonization in global South context. Chokini and Greener, and I'm taking this from a recent article of theirs, talk about studying state corporate regimes of permission, that is, extreme systems of exploitation and dispossession that the global system, which includes states and corporate entities, tend to develop to impose a new global model of capitalist accumulation based on exploitation and dispossession through violent means. So this is a promising strand of research and actually, we can discuss this. I think there's lots of research uh, in Latin America uh, that could be uh, uh, placed under this perspective. Also, there's a, a, an important uh, need to uh, research on gender violence and gender economics. Uh, so, as the expansion of markets and forms of hierarchical and sociocultural uh, gender oppression develop, we should focus on that aspect of violence, of gender violence, to explain one of the basic aspects of the new forms of colonization. Also, this is a very traditional topic in critical criminology. We should focus on racialized and class-based criminalization regimes, especially regarding security, policing, and prisons focus on the enemy within, the unruling classes, or the undeserving poor. Once again, I think there are lots of research in Latin America that uh, critically discuss the process of criminalization and exclusion of uh, marginal and discriminated groups of Latin American societies. And finally, which is a topic of interest of mine, uh, I think we should focus on the growth of the penal state and its historical trajectories. Uh, so there's been a lot of discussion of, about mass imprisonment, the increase of prisoning in Latin America, the punitive turn in Latin America, and most of the times we're doing it with the framework of the political economy developed in the global north. But I think we should focus our attention on a particular aspect, which I think is very salient from the 90s, which is the growth of the penal state. It, that I mean by this that with the process of democratization, paradoxically, also came the strengthening of Latin American states many times under the guise of global uh, north uh, toolkits, which 
developed into a strong and very punitive penal state. So I think that in order to understand this process of the punitive turn in Latin America, we should study uh, Latin American countries, historical trajectories and processes of state building that can explain how Latin American states have developed, have become stronger, especially regarding the crime control fields. So to synthesize these possible topics of research, I am following Chokini and Winner. I think a very promising strand of research is a political economy of neocolonialism and the embedding of inequality and violence on a global scale, which are salient features of Latin American countries. Uh, well, thank you for your attention. I hope I have been more or less clear. And that's my presentation. Thank you so much, Manuel, for such an informative presentation. I wonder if um, everyone would join me, um, if you feel comfortable turning on your cameras, to give um, him a, a virtual round of applause. <laughs> Thank you. Um, we'll hand over now to um, Mauricio for your portion of the presentation. Thank you so much, uh, Lucy, Luis, and Manuel, it's a pleasure being with you today. Uh, I see Maximo Sosa as well. So, hi there. It's always a pleasure uh, being around uh, fellow readers uh, of criminology. Uh, I I'm sorry uh, that my presentation uh, can be as expressive as I would want to. Uh, I'm still suffering from mild uh, COVID-19 symptoms. However, I'll try to make the best uh, to, to make this panorama of Brazilian criminology. Actually, as, as Manuel already uh, explained, it, it's hard to tell if there's a Brazilian criminology. It's, it's easier to say about criminology in Brazil and not Brazilian criminology, as much as we are struggling to find the identity of what would be a Brazilian criminology. Of course, and, and because Brazil in Latin America is kind of an island it's much more like like Britain, right? Um, we're kind of isolated and have uh, local determinations of criminalization process that are very particular, uh, and also some some language barriers not strong enough to to turn uh, dialogue impossible. But it, it makes a I, I, we don't have this this uh, contact with Latin American criminology as uh, an Argentinian or a Chilean professor or a Colombian reader would have. So Brazil is pretty much uh, isolated uh, in its development, although, as I will stress, uh, Manuel is absolutely right, uh, the moment we, which had the most confluence was in the 70s. So uh, my presentation will be uh, uh, separated in four parts. Uh, I'll talk of late 19th century and early 20th century, criminology in Brazil, then from World War II to redemocratization, from redemocratization in the 80s onward, and the present day issues in Brazilian criminology. Uh, so in the late 19th, 19th century and early 20th, uh, remembering that Brazil uh, had an industrialization process that took, uh, um, uh, it, it only uh, uh, grasped it, uh, I mean, it, it, it began really in, in the early 20th century, I would say in the 1920s, 1930s. So this period from the late 19th century to the early 20th will be mainly the incorporation of criminological positivism, especially Italian criminology, uh, and its relative mediation with local specificities. Uh, the problem was with miscegenation, the fear of mixed races, mainly black and European descent and migrants. Uh, I would like to illustrate that very briefly with just this image. Uh, this will be this one. I hope you can see. Can? Yes. So, yes, this will be uh, the redemption of Cam a painting of 1895 by Modesto Brocus. And you can see that uh, the, the idea of whitening people was the main political goal uh, in the idea of incorporating uh, positivist criminology in the sense that we have to prevent mixed races, but in the sense of making them more white. So you can see uh, the, uh, the black grandmother thanking heaven that her descent uh, 
uh, is white and 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 the feeling of the father that's pretty much satisfied with the fact that his descent is more white than black. Uh, and this is also this is important painting also because it illustrates that this process was not imposed. There was there was no prohibition of of interracial marriages or anything like that. Brazil didn't have apartheid or Jim Crow legislation that prevented this kind of mixination, but it it had some impact uh, on migration policies. I'll stop sharing. Then, so. Uh, the problem of mis of miscegenation and, and the idea of eugenics that was brought by the criminological perspective have had limited impact on criminal law, but considerable impact on migration policy. Uh, this is interesting because uh, when we have the the first two main uh, migration process from Europe to Brazil, uh, migrants were forbidden uh, to stop in the northeast, which was the obvious point for 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 coming to Brazil, right? You, you come from Europe and you stop in the, the, the pointy part of Brazil in the northeast. They were obliged to to go all the way down and to arrive at south of Brazil because they want to prevent miscegenation. They didn't want to mix the races over there. So you, you, you see criminological uh, uh, input had a decisive impact in the migration process, but not really in criminal law. The idea of whitening local population was something that had to be embraced by former slaves. And this uh, decided the fixation of Italian, German, Japanese, East Europeans in South and Southeast regions. Uh, this process uh, uh, in the 30s and 40s, now we're talking about the early 20th century, we see some revival of criminological theories uh, to justify the repression against anarchists. So as industrialization growth, again, there was some recall of Italian positivists, especially Ferri, Lombroso and Garofalo, uh, to justify the, the political repression on labor movement against strikes, against uh, the fight for better work conditions. Uh, we had this idea of, of recovering anarchists as some kind of degenerate uh, consequence uh, or the the, the the political option of degenerate personalities. Uh, however, in, in, as this was being revived in academia here, uh, also in, in political uh, criminal policy terms, there was the embracing of fascist ideology. And this brought uh, one paradox that was the cult of Brazilian people and Brazilian identity, the worship of Brazilian ident identity mixed with nationalism, kind of neutralized this revival of positivist criminology. The second part uh, of criminology in Brazil would be from uh, Second World War to redemocratization. It's important to stress that Brazil didn't have the worst dictatorship in Latin America, but had the longest. We were in, the, in, in under authoritarian regime from 64 to 85. So, uh, but the, the repression was not even close to the brutality of Chile or Argentina, for example. Uh, this period from World War II to redemocratization uh, really set up criminology as just an actionary science, something dedicated to what we do call microcriminology, profiling of criminals and prisoners. One test that's still done, right, when you have someone uh, profiled to say to, to state where he's will begin to serve sentence, or when you have cr uh, crimes that will attract a lot of attention, then we just have criminology very much linked to psychology to describe uh, uh, and explain the crime uh, according to the biography uh, of of the imprisoned of the the, the suspect. Uh, also, in the 50s, 60s, and 70s, we had a very much political orientation of repression that uh, took criminological theory away from the scenery. That was just the repression of communist threat. Uh, there was there was no much no there was no need for elaborated criminological theory to justify repression of communists. Uh, uh, at the same time, repression uh, in in this urban growth scenarios, I mean, uh, as, as cities began to get bigger and bigger because of industrialization, especially in the southeast 
é São Paulo, Rio de Janeiro, and other uh, big cities, uh, repression was established uh, under geographical and functional terms. What I wish to express in this is that the segregation of space uh, and the, mar the, marginal the marginalization of urban poor and black population was made without apartheid-like legislation uh, through the confination in slums, in these urban ghettos that we call favelas, and uh, by the attribution of menial jobs uh, for this marginalized population. This would be basically meaning that women would exert housemaid um, uh, jobs and men would be jack of all trades, would be kind of uh, people with, with menial jobs, with no uh, social mobility through employment. Uh, so, and this is very interesting because it's just now being studied um, uh, with some care, with, with some caution, I mean, with, with proper care, uh, the, 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 how was um, racializing uh, the segregation, not, not through specific commands, but the, 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 the discipline of the cities made the coincidence of black people and marginalized people and produce uh, Brazilian geography in terms of a successful uh, enterprise for social control without mobiliz the mobilization of police force, of huge police force. The third part of my presentation will be from redemocratization onward. Uh, that said, uh, from the late 70s onward, uh, we found the progressive incorporation of critical theory and criminology. Manuel just presented, I mean, the main, the main topics on, on this. Uh, we had theoretical frameworks of the Frankfurt School, school uh, works like Hirsch and Kishheimer, together with Marxist tradition, and help it to structure uh, a critique of authoritarian legacy. Uh, of course, uh, labeling approach and the translation of the critical canon in this period was uh, pivotal to the, what we call Latin American criminology. Very, very much political compromised, right? Uh, I mean, very political orientated, uh, and this brings uh, some some independence to Latin American um, criminology. The impact of new criminology in Brazil was deeply felt. Uh, the works of Walton, Walton Taylor, Young, Matthews, etc., and uh, we have to stress that, that in Brazil, uh, critical criminology always, always came together with the abolitionist movement. That doesn't, have, uh, that, that doesn't uh, happen all, all in, in, the, in, in other parts of the world. But in, in Brazil, when you talk about critical criminology, it, it also comes together the abolitionist movement. They're pretty much inseparable, as they were presented in the 70s as something that was uh, uh, consequential, uh, one and the other. So the works of Hulsman, Christy, Matisse, and Scherer, and all others were pretty much uh, the references of critical thought in criminology. Of course, we have to, to stress the impact of Michel Foucault's work, since Brazilian sociology was traditionally linked to French sociology. So Foucault had this main, uh, and, and as Professor Manuel said, the importance of this, this character, uh, Alessandro Barata, who formed pretty much all of Brazilian critical criminologists. So we're talking about Brazil in, in, in 85 onward. If, if you had any criminologist in Brazil, they would be critical criminologists that were under the influence of Alessandro Barata. And why this is important is because Alessandro Barata made uh, a, a disconciliation of critical criminology with, uh, uh, with philosophy. And the way of presenting criminology in Brazil is still much more like in this framework since uh, 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 what would be a normal lecture in, in criminology in Brazil will just be the presentation of the history of criminological thought, right? And not actually teaching people how to make criminological investigation. So very strong influence of Alessandro Barata over uh, uh, criminology in Brazil. Uh, then we had the overlapping of Latin American criminological thought, this, as I said before, politically engaged with emancipation and theoretically very much colonized by European authors, despite much rich and original contributions. Uh, this subordination of crim Brazilian criminology to European tradition uh, was felt in the 90s and first decade of the 21st century, not only because of neoliberalism uh, emergence, as Manuel uh, said, but also in my point of view, 
because the, the, we were suffering the beginning of the punitive turn and the, neo, the, the mainstream critical theories were very much uh, like able to explain this. So we, we were under Fernando Henrique Cardoso government, which was a neoliberal government, and we just had translated Luic Vacan and, and others, and, and it, it kind of suited perfectly. But the problem was, and Luis Del Santo know that, knows that better than anyone here, the problem is, is that when things start to be explained by neoliberalism, then Brazil had the Workers' Party elected in 2002, and this was precisely the moment when incarceration rates just went crazy up. Right? And we were unable to explain the rise of prison population, the growth of prison population. We were unable to explain uh, how much police nowadays torture, how much uh, we have pre-trial detention, how much poli uh, police homicide we have because we were living our golden days with the Labour Party, with the Workers' Party in the executive field. So Bra Brazil had, in 2005, approximately 4% unemployment. This was the lowest rate, the lowest rate of unemployment of our history. And precisely on this uh, same year, we see the, uh, a rise in prison population that is being unmatched by any country in the world. I mean, it just goes straight up. So how could it be? Then was when we realized that we could no longer be dependent on uh, criminology from the global north, that they they were wrong about us or they were, they were wrong at all, right? Uh, so, and now this will be the last part of my presentation. Uh, I, I really think that Brazil is kind of the criminological land of the future, <laughs> not only because we have all the problems with crime, you name it, right? Uh, uh, huge prison population, torture, uh, police uh, 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 arbitrariness. Uh, I mean, uh, uh, the complicity of judges and prosecutors with little violence, is, uh, it's, it's pretty much uh, 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 the perfect place to study uh, how the, the centrality of, of crime in the uh, 21st century. Um, but one thing that, that's also interesting about criminology in Brazil is that we don't have, as, as critical criminologists, we really don't have an opposition. We cannot find in Brazilian history uh, right-wing criminologists that are working administrative criminology, uh, that, that are uh, passing instruction to politicians to justify repression, no, they're only uh, gravitating in, in the traditional sense of, of moral entrepreneurs, etc., of populism, in the sense of just exploiting social panics, etc., to have more uh, sanctions, more crimes defined in law. Uh, despite that, the, the centrality of prison in, 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 as the main crime against humanity in Brazil, uh, with more than 700,000 inmates, uh, we're still suffering from the influence of European trends. One thing that I regret a lot uh, is the fragmentation of critical criminology in Brazil. And I would like to discuss that, if possible. I mean, uh, we see the fragmentation of critical criminology. You have rural criminology, feminist criminology, visual criminology, uh, convict criminology. You know what criminology. You have all this kaleidoscope of criminology. But uh, problems in Brazil... Uh, are not needed to be studied in these very diverse frames of perspectives. Our problem is very brutal, very uh, uh, in itself uh, enough to be analyzed by uh, 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 an orthodox critical perspective, maybe. This, this will be my, my line of thought. So we have a, a radical need uh, for uh, criminological imagination, yeah? and satanizing criminology is part of this effort. Because southernizing criminology obliges us to think from an epistemological point of view, what is the starting point of thinking our criminal justice problems, the criminalization process in Brazil, uh, under uh, uh, these determinations that weren't uh, prevalent in, in traditional uh, criminological perspectives. Uh, uh, th there are many names for this in Brazil right now. We not only talk about uh, decolonial thought, but also theory of dependence and other approaches that stress the power of, of imperialism in our region. So this will be my, my main considerations. Again, uh, I'm sorry 
Actually, I, I think that nowadays my Deutsch is pretty much better than my English, but I think that the message was <laughs> COVID. And once again, I, I, was, I was unable to prepare for this as I would want since uh, I had a couple of bad five days with COVID. But still, well, uh, yeah, I mean, this will be the main topics of, of, of my exposure. Uh, and I am, of course, uh, able to attend any questions that you might have. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Mauricio. Uh, can I just call you to join me with another round of applause? Over to Mauricio now. Fantastic. Really well done. Uh, well, so we just had two brilliant presentations.